Hey, we're already start browsing the internet. <laughs> okay, well, our uh, guest speaker today is Dr. Toria Eaton. Uh, Dr. Eaton is a native of Morocco, uh, but she got her PhD at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, she's a horticulturist, and uh, about three or four years ago, she uh, started at Lincoln University of Missouri, which is in Jefferson City, uh, Missouri, and she's going to uh, tell us about some of her ongoing research. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to Iowa State University. This is my first time in Iowa, and my husband is so glad that we have never been in, in Iowa. <laughs> so we are normally from the East, the East Coast. We are from the Boston area, University of Massachusetts. So this is a really great opportunity to see Iowa, and um, my husband told me, say hi to the people of Iowa, so say hi. <laughs> <laughs> And I really, I drove yesterday, it took me five hours from where I am to here, and the drive was just so peaceful, all this space, and I was just hoping to be there at night so I could see all those stars, because in the East Coast you don't see that, you are always blocked by the buildings and stuff like that, and the hills, we have so many mountains and here, so it's just such a pretty area. So uh, my presentation is about the nutrient accumulation in vegetable crops. And um, how this project came about, you know, um, when you know when you when you are postdoc and faculty, people will send you books and say, "Would you please review this book for me?" And it is good, you know. So you read the book and you review it, and then you say, you write a little review, and that review gets published in what in our situation in the American Society of Horticultural Science. Um, uh, journal, so in hot science, and then you just uh, you know say you know what the book is addresses and how many pictures it has and how many pages and how much it costs and do you think it is a good and stuff. And this book that was sent to me to to review was talking about the fact that the mineral nutrient concentration of vegetables has been declining in the past five years, and I said, oh my God, this is actually really very interesting. So I really got, got in the book, and I started really to read it, because it was just interesting. How does the nutrient concentration get, you know, lower and lower and lower and smaller in the vegetable crops, and why? And the book was mostly about the history and, uh, and, and the accumulation of fruits and vegetables. So, so that is the justification how this project really started. So it seems like the literature really indicate, and there were so many papers listed in that book and stuff like that, so I went and I read some of the papers and stuff, and all of them, they say that the nutrient concentration in the fruits and vegetables has been declining in the past 50 years, but nobody says why, and, and probably, so when I talked to our team about it and we started to brainstorm, so it could be that the soil is depleted, that the soil is not as fertile as it used to be because the vegetables for them to, to have high concentration of nutrients, they have nowhere to get it from other than the soil. So the soil has to be fertile. So we said, well, probably the soil is not as fertile as it used to be or probably the, this uh, breeding that has been done on the fruit and vegetables, most of the time the breeding is done for higher yield, you know, and or, or for uh, longer shelf life, but nobody really breeds for nutrient uh, concentration and stuff. And, and, and if the breeding is for high yield, does that jeopardize, you know, the nutrient concentration? Probably, the fruit and vegetable, they accumulate more carbon <coughs> than they accumulate the, the nutrients. Maybe they grow so fast that, that the uh, nutrient uptake, you know, does not um, uh, follow the carbon, you know, um, on set on, on the plant. And, and that's why we started this project, and it was just very intriguing to me and interesting. And this these two uh, letters varieties, I will talk about them later on in the project, uh, red deer tongue and uh, custom uh, stuff. So they are not there just for decoys because we are going to talk about them later on. So um, 
So the, the objective of the study was, are there, is there anything that we can do to increase the nutrient accumulation in fruits and vegetables? So the objective was to develop some system that will introduce what we call nutrient dense crops, and that will be good for the farmers because they will market their crops as nutrient dense tomato, nutrient dense lettuce, maybe they can make more money out of it. Um, and the hypothesis to be tested, can we actually increase the accumulation of mineral nutrients through selecting the cultivars that probably will, will uh, uh, absorb more nutrients than others, or through some nutritional regime? Does the, the conventional fertility regime lead to more nutrients in the fruit and vegetables? Does it matter if it is organic or, or uh, convulsional? How about uh, the compost, the farmer that uses compost? So do any of these systems deliver more nutrients to, to the, the plants? And that is the hypothesis to be tested. So what we, so what we, we used, uh, am I in here or did I pass one? Yeah. So what we used is 18 cultivars of lettuce, and this study actually we included lettuce, tomatoes, and cabbage, and I will talk very briefly about tomatoes and cabbage, but I will go in detail about lettuce. So we used 18 cultivars of lettuce, and nine of them are hair low varieties, and some of them are modern varieties, and to see if the, this breeding really had some effect or not, and three fertility regime, conventional, compost, and organic. And we used randomized com complete block design which splits fertility regime. So for every block we have, here is the conventional, here is the organic, and here is the compost. And we used three blocks. So the varieties that we used, the nine varieties of the hair long are these ones here, they are butternut, uh, uh, crunch to the red deer tongue that is at the end. And for the modern varieties, these are the cultivars, the modern varieties that we use uh, from the Adriana to the two stars. And uh, the soil fertility regimes, we actually tried to get as close as possible to 75, 75, 75 pounds per acre of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Either we use compost or organic or conventional, we really tried that, that every fertility regime will deliver 75 pounds per acre of nitrogen, 75 pounds per acre of phosphorus, and 75 uh, pounds per acre of, uh, of, of potassium, and this is according to the, the guide of vegetable production. Uh, so for the compost, we used that the, it is collected for the Office of Waste Management. And uh, to get to this 75-75, uh, we needed to use 20 tons per acre because before you use the compost, you have to analyze it to see how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium it has. The organic, we, uh, the nutrients were supplied individually. We used soybean, meal for nitrogen, bone meal for phosphorus and mine potassium sulfate for potassium. For the conventional we use 10, 10, 10. So for the data, once the uh, lettuce got to, relatively speaking, the maturity level, see how the lettuce, you know, we have different varieties, they look different. And, so we got the fresh weight, so we harvested the, the heads and we took the fresh weight. And then after that, we, you know, we took that sample and we dried it in the oven at 70 degrees, um, uh, at, at 70 degrees. And then actually that was between 70 and between um, 130. We were, we were trying to find what is the temperature really that will get the sample in the inductive couple plasma spectroscopy to find out how much uh, phosphorus we have, how much potassium, how much magnesium and so forth. 
And then after that, we, when we got all the data, then we analyzed them using SAS. So those are our graduate students, and this one actually ground the samples and put them in those little, um, little envelopes, and uh, this one he is um, uh, um, actually dissolving the sample of the plant into nitric acid so that after that we can go ahead and uh, take the readings. So what we found is that we found that in terms of fresh weight really heirloom and modern they have pretty much the same fresh weight. You remember when we said that probably the cultivars they were bred for higher yield which is more weight. So it doesn't seem that that is really true because we did not find any significance in the accumulation of matter instead. Heirloom or, or modern does not seem to be bigger or, or smaller. And uh, in terms of the concentration of um, heirloom and modern cultivars, we, we found like it depends on the element. Like for, for, for phosphorus, Heirloom and modern, they accumulated the same. There was no difference. There was a dif difference in potassium, that the modern accumulated more potassium than heirloom. Uh, in calcium, the modern accumulated more than the heirloom. In magnesium, the heirloom accumulated more than the modern. And so uh, the, the same in uh, the, the, the term of uh, micronutrients, the only difference that we found is just in zinc, where the hair, the hair loam acc uh, accumulated more zinc than the modern. So it depends on the element, and that is actually our next step in our program is to just study one element at a time. So in terms of the soil fertility, um, fertility um, uh, regime, it seems that commercial, which is conventional and compost, they pretty much gave us the same fresh weight and we both um, yielded more weight than the organic. So compost and commercial, they did better than the organic. So in terms of cultivars, there we really found very big differences. So those are 18 varieties. And in here, we took the top five accumulators of nutrients and the lower five accumulators. So these varieties here, they accumulate the one, the, these are the five on the top, and these are the five in the bottom. And what we found is that some varieties, they are among the five first accumulators again and again and again. So you, you see this red deer tongue that shows up in so many elements, see? It shows up in the magnesium, it shows up in, in calcium, it shows up in potassium, and it shows up in phosphorus. In all these elements, it is always accumulating more, more elements than the, the ones that are in here. It is always on the top. So this one for us, it is considered to be a variety that is more nutritious than the other varieties because it has just more nutrients. Then among them, there are some, some varieties like the coastal star that is pretty much on the bottom of, of, of many of the elements. So it is in the bottom of phosphorus, it is in the bottom of, um, uh, of, of uh, um, potassium, and, and then for the other elements, it is just below, just a just little bit above this. So it is not really here. It's not in the first five uh, uh, varieties. So when we looked at the micro, uh, micro um, uh, nutrients, then again, it is the same story. So you see that the red beer tongue, again, it is always on the top five accumulators of the micronutrients and coastal star it is in all the five cultivars that are supposed to be, to be accumulated really the lowest. So this really tells us that there are some cultivars that accumulate more mineral nutrients and there are some cultivars that do not accumulate a, a lot of uh, nutrients. So for us the cultivars really gave us a very good uh, data. 
So, so we, we just went ahead and we just grouped them to just see a comparison of Reed Deer Tog and Coastal Star and see, you know, what are the, the, the differences. So in phosphorus and potassium, so you see A, 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 um, and then A, 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 A. In Reed Deer Tog, most of the time accumulated a lot more nutrients than Coastal Star, okay? So if you want to have lunch and you have to choose between these two letters, would you, would you uh, choose red deer tongue or would you choose costa? So I would sh choose the red deer tongue, uh, you know, because it is more nutritious than the other one. So in conclusion, higher concentration of most elements occurred with chemical or organic uh, fertility regime. And significant differences occur between modern and heritage, but not with no specific trend really. And this is really what was really important is just the, among the cultivars, there was really a very big difference. Like here is the red deer tongue that is accumulated twice as much as, uh, as much iron than the coastal star. So when we did the, uh, the same experiments with tomatoes. In terms of tomatoes, we, we, we actually worked with 24 varieties, 12 of them modern and 12 of them um, heritage. And in here, the same thing, uh, you know, happened, is that we found that there are really very large differences uh, among the cultivars. For in terms of the fertility regimes, some fertility regime give us more uh, elements in like phosphorus, the other one give us more potassium. So there is no, no trend. We cannot say for sure that conventional give us higher concentration of nutrients, you know, of, of all nutrients, you know. But there is, you know, difference among the element. But when we go to the cultivars, then for sure we found that some varieties of uh, uh, tomatoes, they definitely um, accumulated m uh, way more uh, nutrients than, than others. And in that situation, celebrity definitely was more nutritious than uh, Moscovich. So the same thing when we went to the, uh, when we uh, worked with cabbage, for cabbage we, we worked again with 18 varieties, and again we found that some cultivars accumulated more nutrients than others. In this situation, like Charmont was always on the top five, and Red Dynasty was always in the, in the lower uh, five. Like for, for Charmont accumulate twice as much phosphorus as Red Dynasty, and actually all you know, I always thought, actually, many people think that the red cabbage is more nutritious than the white cabbage, and that is really not what we found. So it seems like, uh, so this is really what we found. So uh, as a conclusion, for the fertility regimes, there is still a lot more studies that we have to do to really find out which fertility regime is better for uh, accumulation of, of what nutrients. But in, in terms of cultivars, we know for sure that the nutrient concentration of vegetables can be increased through cultivar selection. So if we just choose the right selections, then we can uh, grow the, the, uh, uh, the most nutritious crops. And this is uh, the end of my uh, presentation. Do you have any questions? But it was not the case for the other five, the other top five and the lower five. It was not always the case that the more nutritious was the, and statistically speaking, there was not really um, um, a difference um, yeah, in there. 
So this is a beginning of the program. Uh, we still have, you know, much to do. We probably will work with correlation between the weight and the nutrient accumulation. Some shortcoming to this study that we are trying to offset is that to do this side-by-side -side conventional and organic, we had to do it in a conventional farm because we cannot do it in an organic farm. So that does not give a lot of, uh, uh, we, we would not really know what the organic is because, because there, there will be some, um, some um, uh, nutrients that are residual in the soil and they are not accounted for. So, it, so, so those are, you know, some of the things that, uh, you know, so we did not find, so to offset that, we are gonna do some greenhouse experiments, and uh, it is just because of the large number of cultivars we wanted to start with, uh, with the field. Now that we have, we, we pretty much have this five and five, Maybe we are gonna concentrate on those five and five and then do more studies using, greenhouse will be the best. Um, the, uh, the farm manager of the organic farm, he will kill me if I do this experiment in his plots. So probably that is not a good idea. So I think that the best way to do it is to, to do a greenhouse. Uh, uh, and then the other, um, the, the other, um, uh, step that we have to do is to go element by element because you cannot really you know work on them all together but we have like a first step yeah um seems to me that you've selected for high and low of the three crops perfect experiment to me would be make a cross in a population say green for all the traits like you can really track down exactly what nutrient was doing what what, what nutrients? Oh, that would be much more valuable than just comparing cultivars. So you're talking about a, a breeding, develop a mapping population. You have you selected the highs and lows for each crop. Mm -hmm. Just cross them and get a segregated population, and then you've got data coming out. What would that data? If you cross it that way, what what would that data tell you? It would tell you which loci actually encoded which trait. So maybe that is something that we should consider doing then. In, in I think you should. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like a multi-year thing then, Roger? Or what? I don't know. To me, you've selected highs and lows for three crops. To me, that's the next step. Take a cross. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, previously? Well, the literature that we have, it just says that the nutrient concentration of fruit and vegetable has been decreasing. That was, the, that was what it is saying. And um, uh, there's a laboratory that analyzes nutrients for, for people, you know, people send them samples and then they will analyze them and they have been doing this forever. And, you know, little by little, they started to see this trend that there is a decrease in, in the nutrients, you know, you know, with, in the past 50 years. And, and th this is, to my knowledge, we did not see this study. If we did, then we would not have done this. So is your end goal no. to select for the best nutrient varieties? <laughs> yes. So that's what I'm saying. To make a cross between your highs and lows for each crop, mm -hmm. you can select, you have much more powerful selection amongst the population for exactly what trait you want. Yeah, and that is and that is a very good idea. Um, thank you. We will incorporate it. This is a program, as I said, we just started it. So we are gonna we will have all kinds of ideas to make right. this, you know, generate more more knowledge about how to go with. They, I mean, it is just that really people now, they are much more aware about the role of fruits and vegetables in their diet. People have started to eat a lot more fruits and vegetables. There are so many vegetarians that are out there. Like like for iron, we found that serenity of talk is really very rich in, in iron. And 
If you are vegetarian and you don't eat meat, meat is really very good source of iron, so you need really to have some very good fruits and vegetables to eat, you know, to, uh, uh, to compensate for lack of meat, yeah. So I'm just wondering if over the last 50 years there's also been a, a, an improvement in the water use efficiency of the plants. But it seems like at least for soluble nutrients, one of the major drivers for nutrient, mineral nutrient must be how much water is coming up through them. And so if they've been selecting for less water use, you would naturally have a byproduct of less mineral nutrition. Have you looked at it from that perspective when you look at the literature? We actually, the literature that we went through, nothing really was talking about uh, about about the uh, about the water. But it does make sense that if there is a very if the if the fruit and vegetable are accumulating lots of water, then that will yield to 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 a lower concentration. Um, the next step from this, which is just from our data, we will just look for the accumulation of nutrients. It's just by multiplying the concentration by the dry weight. That will give us, that will um, um, eliminate the water from the picture. And that is something that we are um, going to do. Um, but if, if a plant is really inefficient in its water use, the snowmates are open all the time, it keeps bringing in water, it's evaporating, and you should get a really much higher concentration. So as, I mean, as if, if, if there is a lot of water, you think there will be a lot of concentration? It's not water, it's the water use efficiency. So, I mean, if you, you want your plant to, to not waste water, you want it to close their stomachs, right? Oh, I see. And so you, the less water you bring in, the more efficient it is from a, from a system perspective, but the less nutrients you would have. Well, that is a very nice other corner, you know, to, to look at. So um, there is there is also, you know, the humidity factor, you know, for the, for the calcium, you know, calcium is it, absorbed mainly because of the, um, uh, how do we call it? Because transpiration, as the plants transpire in the calcium. So there is a lot of other factors other than that, but this is just a one, a small piece of the past. But but that is actually very good, uh, you know, would be good experiments to do, and it will be easy to do in, in, in the greenhouse. Yes. Victoria, another thing might be interesting to look at your data would be the type of lettuce. For example, coastal star is a romaine type. You can continue. Yeah, that, that is actually included. That is, uh, that was, I just wanted to make it a little Sorry, bit, oh, you're talking? You know okay, is. so those first, those nine, nine, that was not, you know, random. So those nine was the loose leaf letters mm -hmm. and the, the head letters. So it was three different ph phenotypes. True. It is just to make the presentation a little bit clearer. I talk why, because then there are too many variables and, uh, yeah. And then yeah, it would yeah. be interesting to see the data yes. based on head type. Yeah. Like and we did not find type. a difference. So that's why I just took it. But we did not find a difference to the type, the phenotype. You know, there was no difference on uh, uh, between uh, the varieties or between the fertility regimes uh, in terms of Phenotype. It's not because this is this phenotype they accumulated more under this fertility regime or more in this uh, other fertility regime. So we did not find a difference, and that's why I removed it. But those nine, there was three, three, and three, and those are the three kinds of lettuce: the loose leaf lettuce, and then the head lettuce. And I do not remember what the third, the the third type is. Yeah, the Coastal star is the uh, romaine type and the... Yeah, the romaine, yeah. Uh, romaine lettuce, the, the, the head lettuce, and then the root. Go ahead. Um, I was going to... I was... Because your, your data did not support the fact that people have found this reduction in nutrient status and so But you also very clearly showed in your data that different varieties have different amounts of nutrients, and so I wonder how those varieties played into the data that was in the book, right? Yeah. So variety is obviously playing a big role in the nutrients. Yeah, well, that is that is true. I don't know which kind of varieties they had or whatever, but it was very, 
good idea for this laboratory to put all that data together and say, oh, look at that. And we are just actually, this is just a laboratory that is just analyzing, you know, and they did find this trend, but then it's not actually only here that we found that the trend. Even in Europe, there is literature that even in Europe, the, 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 the fact that there is this trend that the, the nutrient concentration, the mineral nutrient concentration is going down and down and down in the past 50 years. So do you think that could also have to do with what the prevalent varieties of lettuce are that people are eating, right? You know, a few years ago, I don't know, ice cream lettuce was the big lettuce, right? And now, not too many people are eating that, but now it's more the main lettuce. Yeah. So could that also have, have yeah, that is, well, that's, yeah, that's why we wanted to, that's why we wanted to study this, you know? Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, uh, the sad part about it is that when we wanted to replicate the experiment, uh, uh, I mean to do other things in the experiment, and we looked for like a little bit of it's not in the market anymore. Mm -hmm. So we don't even find it to continue to do that. Here is a very nice, uh, um, you know, nutrient accumulator uh, lettuce, and now it is not even in the market. So as you said, I mean, it is just amazing that so many varieties flood the market every year. And as you said, probably it is just the choice, the choice of people, of people, you know, is, is changing, that's the one. And that's why we, we thought that probably the hair long, that people do not eat as much of as the modern are not used. So maybe the hair long are more nutrient, more nutrient dense than the modern. But then we did not find that. So, so but this is, again, as, as I said, it is still to be, you know, to, to work on and, and find out. But for the time being, that is what we found, yeah. Yes. So we have one more question. So the, the fertility regime between organic, conventional, and the compost, so uh, the goal was to get to 75 pounds per acre of ten p 5 and k Yeah. With the compost, uh, what is the percentage of availability you are assuming? Well, the, the compost, we analyzed it, okay. so just like a solid test. And then we used the amount that is needed to give us this uh, close, as close as possible, 75, 70. It, it turned out to be 20 tons per acre. Yeah, no, yeah in this particular, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my question is, when we apply compost, we assume that year one, it's only 30 to 35 percent of nitrogen is available. Rest will be available year two, another 20, 30 percent year three. So how much did you consider Availability for nitrogen for year one. Well, we did not test for nitrogen for the accumulation of nitrogen, so we did not test that. We were mostly interested in the other mineral nutrients. So maybe that still has a factor, and that is that is that's what I said. There is still some shortcoming, you know, of the, of the experiment, but. But, but we did not test for the, the nitrogen, we tested for the other uh, uh, um, mineral nutrients and because of cation exchange capacity, they will be residual in the soil even if the, you know. So, so those are the things that we found. Um, sometimes conventional actually give us a little bit more accumulation than, than, the, than the organic for some elements. So we want to go back and just work on one element at a time, you know, and see what we will find. Um, another thing that we are thinking now that we are looking at the mineral nutrients, why don't we expand this to phenolics and, you know, to other antioxidants and stuff like that so we can, you know, there is potential for this project. Other questions for Dr. E? Yes. Uh, have you, is there any way of testing how much of these nutrients are actually available when you consume the vegetables? Try to see if that correlates to the measurement you're doing. So you're not selecting for the one with more minerals, but the one with actually the most nutritious? Uh, no, we did not. We, ju we just looked at the concentration in the fruit or in the vegetable, but whatever, in, in, in whatever uh, organic, uh, in whatever treatment, 
Uh, if it is going to be bioavailable, it's going to be bioavailable. I don't think the treatment will affect the bioavailability. I mean, it will affect the concentration, but if it is there, it's going to be the same. So well, you're comparing different uh, varieties. Um, and what if one variety you, has how more would, bioavailability? How would you test the bioavailability? Uh, that was my first question. Is there any way? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I just, you know, I did not think about it, to tell you the truth, but I just feel that if it is, if, if, if phosphorus is bioavailable in letters, then it is going to be bioavailable. Uh, I mean, I do not see why, why the, uh, the fertility regime will affect the bioavailability. The fertility regime maybe will affect the concentration, but it is there, or it is not there. But once it is there, it is either bioavailable or not. Bioavailability, my knowledge is very limited in bioavailability, but it seems to me like it is, it depends on other ways of eating. Like some elements, they are bioavailable when they are in contact with fats. So when, you when know, you're comparing different like varieties, would you also assume okay. that it's gonna I, be the same? I don't know, one? but but, but it could be a good research project, you know, to say that this, uh, these two varieties, we compare them, and both of them, they have the same concentration of phosphorus, but phosphorus from this variety is more bioavailable than this one. So that will be good, you know. I just need to find a way to determine the bioavailability. <laughs> so maybe sometime you will find a paper with the bioavailability of mineral nutrients. Any questions? Yeah, thank you.